Imagine sitting by a fire, the crackle of flames your only comfort as shadows stretch across a prehistoric plain. In the darkness beyond, saber-toothed cats stalk the grass, mammoths thunder in the distance, and every breath could be your last. Survival is fragile, yet here's the shocking truth. If you made it past childhood, your chances of living a long, meaningful life were far greater than you've been told. Forget Hollywood's myth of cavemen dying at 25. Ancient humans could thrive into old age. And their elders weren't just survivors. They were the secret weapon of humanity. Tonight, we're traveling back through time to uncover how our ancestors defied nature, cared for one another, and built the foundations of everything we are today. When we picture prehistoric humans, most of us imagine a brutal and short existence. Ragged, worn-down people collapsing in their 20s, their lives snuffed out by predators, disease, or sheer exhaustion. Hollywood reinforces this idea, portraying cavemen as doomed to die young. But the truth is far more fascinating, and far more human. The myth comes from a misunderstanding of a single statistic, life expectancy. If you've ever heard that, the average caveman only lived to 30. It sounds like they aged rapidly and dropped dead before middle age. But here's the catch. Life expectancy at birth is heavily influenced by one factor. Infant mortality. In ancient times, as many as half of all children didn't survive past age five. That staggering number drags down the average for the entire population. Think of it this way. Imagine a group of ten prehistoric people. Four of them die in early childhood. The others survive into their 40s, 50s, even 60s. When you calculate the average, it looks like everyone only lived to about 30. But in reality, those who survived childhood often lived long, meaningful lives. To really understand how long ancient humans lived, we need to look at lifespan instead of life expectancy. Lifespan asks, if you made it past childhood, how long could you live? And the answer is surprising. Survival into the 40s and 50s wasn't unusual. In fact, elders became central to their communities, carrying wisdom, stories, and survival skills. This flips our assumptions upside down. Ancient life wasn't just short and brutal. It was a delicate balance of risk and resilience, where making it past childhood opened the door to decades of experience and leadership. Numbers tell one side of the story, but bones, teeth, and skulls tell another. Fossils give us a window into the lives of our ancient ancestors. And what they reveal is astonishing. Survival into old age was not only possible, it was more common than we once believed. Take the site of Dimanisi, Georgia, dating back nearly 1.8 million years. Among the remains of early Homo erectus, archaeologists found something extraordinary. The skull of an elder known as the Old Man of Dimanisi. He had lost all of his teeth years before his death. In a world where chewing raw meat and fibrous plants was essential, this should have been a death sentence. Yet he lived for years without teeth. How? His group must have cared for him, softening food, sharing marrow, helping him survive. This wasn't just biology. It was humanity in its earliest form. Fast forward to the Neanderthals, our close cousins. At Shanidar Cave in Iraq, the remains of a Neanderthal male nicknamed Shanidar I tell an even more dramatic story. He lived well into his 40s or 50s despite being partially blind, deaf, crippled in one arm, and suffering severe leg injuries. He couldn't hunt or gather. Yet his community fed him, protected him, and even buried him with flowers. Compassion, not just strength, kept him alive. These fossils challenge the stereotype of brutish cavemen who abandoned the weak. Instead, they reveal something far more powerful. Early humans recognized the value of their elders. Long-lived individuals weren't accidents of nature. They were evidence of communities that nurtured, protected, and learned from their most vulnerable members. Every healed bone, every toothless jaw is proof. Our ancestors didn't just fight to survive, they fought to keep each other alive. To truly understand ancient lifespans, we can't just look at fossils. We also need to look at the people living closest to that way of life today. Modern hunter-gatherer societies. They offer a living mirror of the conditions our ancestors faced for tens of thousands of years. And the patterns are remarkable. Studies of groups like the Hadza of Tanzania, the Tsimeni of Bolivia, 
and the sand of Southern Africa show that once a person survives the treacherous early years of childhood, their chances of living a long life increase dramatically. In fact, many reach their 50s, 60s, and even 70s. Among some groups, the most common age of death for adults, not the average, but the mode, falls between 68 and 78 years old. That's shockingly close to what we see in modern societies with advanced medicine. How is this possible without hospitals, antibiotics, or supermarkets? The answer lies in lifestyle. Hunter-gatherers eat unprocessed, nutrient-rich diets, stay physically active every day, and live in tightly knit communities. These factors don't erase danger. Accidents, infections, and scarcity always loom. But they create resilience that supports long lives. And crucially, elders in these societies aren't sidelined. They are teachers, healers, storytellers, and keepers of tradition. An Inuit elder can predict the weather by the shape of the clouds. An Amazonian grandmother knows which plant cures a fever. An Aboriginal elder guides disputes using centuries-old law. Their knowledge doesn't just enrich their groups. It keeps them alive. This perspective reshapes our view of prehistory. The myth of cavemen dying young dissolves when we look at both fossils and living parallels. The truth is clear. Survival into old age wasn't rare. It was part of humanity's strength. If Chapter 1 shattered the myth of short, brutal lives, Chapter 2 asks a deeper question. What happened to those who grew old in a world without modern comforts? The answer lies in some of the most haunting yet inspiring fossils ever found. Fossils that prove survival was never just about strength, but about community. We return first to Dimenisi, Georgia, where the old man of Dimenisi lived 1.8 million years ago. Toothless, frail, and long past his physical prime, he should have been doomed. Yet his healed jaw tells us he lived for years after losing every tooth. His survival means his group softened food, cracked bones for marrow, and cared for him. In a world where every scrap of meat and root mattered, this was no small sacrifice. Why would they keep him alive? Because his wisdom, where to find flint, how to avoid predators, which plants healed wounds, was priceless. Now, leap forward to Shanadar Cave in Iraq, where Neanderthals lived nearly 50,000 years ago. The remains of Shanadar I tell a story that almost defies belief. He was half-blind, partially deaf, crippled in one arm, and injured in his leg. Hunting and gathering were impossible for him. Yet he lived for decades. His people must have carried him through mountains, shared food, and shielded him from danger. And when he finally died, they laid him to rest gently, surrounded by flowers, evidence of one of the earliest funerary rituals ever discovered. Fossils like these are not just bones. They are proof of something uniquely human. Our ancestors didn't abandon their weak. They protected them. In the harshest conditions imaginable, Compassion became a survival tool, and elders became the heart of the community. It's easy to imagine prehistoric life as pure physical struggle. Who could run fastest, strike hardest, or endure pain the longest? But the truth is, survival wasn't just about muscle. It was about memory, knowledge, strategy. And that's where elders became indispensable. Picture a campfire at night. Younger hunters cluster around the flames, eager but inexperienced. An elder sits close by, their voice carrying over the crackle of firewood. They describe the subtle signs of animal tracks, the shift of wind that signals danger, the hidden stream that never dries even in drought. This knowledge isn't written down. It lives only in memory, and without elders it would vanish forever. In fact, researchers studying modern hunter-gatherers show that elders are often the most valuable members of their communities. Among the Inuit, Seasoned hunters predict storms and migrations with uncanny accuracy, saving entire groups from disaster. In the Amazon, older shamans hold vast knowledge of medicinal plants, wisdom that can mean the difference between life and death. In Aboriginal Australia, elders guide disputes using ancient law, preventing bloodshed with a few words of authority. Prehistoric elders likely played these same roles. Even if their bodies weakened, their minds held libraries of survival strategies. A younger hunter might be stronger, but without the elder's advice, he could lead the group straight into danger. The old man of Dimenisi may not have chewed meat, but he knew where to find flint. Shanadar I couldn't hunt, but he could teach flint-napping techniques to the young. In a world without books or maps, 
Elders weren't just respected, they were essential. They weren't burdens. They were the living memory of their people, the thread that bound past knowledge to future survival. When we think of evolution, we often picture the survival of the fittest, the strong thriving while the weak are left behind. But fossils and anthropology reveal something far more complex. Survival of the kindest. Compassion wasn't a luxury. It was a strategy that gave humanity its edge. Imagine two prehistoric groups. One abandons its sick and elderly, focusing only on the young and strong. The other shares food with the toothless, shelters the injured, and listens to the wisdom of its elders. Which group has the advantage? The second, why? Because compassion builds resilience. Elders guide hunters away from danger, help resolve conflicts before they become deadly, and preserve vital knowledge. By investing in the vulnerable, the group strengthens its chances of survival as a whole. Even in the harshest conditions, this instinct for care appears again and again. At Shanidar, Neanderthals buried their dead with flowers. At Dimenisi, Homo erectus kept their frail alive. Across continents and millennia, early humans chose connection over abandonment. And these choices weren't just sentimental, they were practical. They made survival possible. This is where our ancestors differed from predators around them. Lions didn't nurse their lame. Wolves didn't keep their elderly alive for years. But humans did. And that decision, to value compassion as much as strength, laid the foundation for everything that came after. Culture, tradition, and eventually civilization itself. The evidence is clear. Elders weren't dead weight in prehistoric societies. They were anchors. Compassion wasn't weakness. It was the ultimate survival tool. Without it, humanity might never have endured. For hundreds of thousands of years, human life followed the same rhythm. Hunting, gathering, moving with the seasons and relying on shared knowledge to survive. But around 12,000 years ago, something seismic happened. People began to plant seeds. They began to stay in one place. They became farmers. At first glance, this might sound like an obvious upgrade. Farming meant food security, storage, and the ability to support larger populations. But the shift from foraging to farming was not an easy road. It was a revolution that reshaped human bodies, societies, and even lifespans. Hunter-gatherers lived in small, mobile bands. They ate diverse diets of plants, nuts, berries, meat, and fish. Their bodies were lean, their bones strong, and infectious disease was rare in scattered groups. When farming took root, Diets narrowed, often to a single staple like wheat, rice, or maize. Malnutrition appeared in the archaeological record. Shorter stature, weaker bones, and more dental problems. And then came crowding. Farming villages meant people living side by side with animals, in permanent settlements. With this came waste parasites and epidemic disease, where hunter-gatherer groups might lose members to accidents or scarcity. Farmers began dying from new plagues. Life expectancy often dropped compared to their foraging ancestors, but there was no going back. Farming allowed surpluses, trade, and population growth. It created villages that became cities, and cities that became civilizations. For the elderly, this new world was a mixed blessing. On one hand, food surpluses could sustain them longer. On the other, disease and malnutrition often struck them first. The role of elders shifted as societies grew more complex. But one thing remained the same. Their knowledge was still vital. The transition from hunting to farming didn't just change how humans ate. It changed how they lived, died, and remembered their past. If farming was the spark that lit civilization, it also cast a shadow over human health. For early farmers, life became a strange paradox. More food overall, but worse nutrition. More people in one place, but more disease. Greater security but harsher inequality. And these changes shaped how long people lived. Archaeologists digging at some of the earliest farming villages, like Çatalhöyük in Turkey or Mergar in Pakistan, found skeletons riddled with signs of stress. Many individuals died young from infections that spread easily in crowded settlements. Infant mortality remained high, and for those who survived childhood, the risk of famine or epidemic was never far away. Average life expectancy often dipped below that of hunter-gatherers. But there was another side to this story. Farming allowed some to live longer than ever before. 
With stable food supplies, certain individuals, often community leaders, healers, or elders, reached advanced ages. Their survival hints at the beginnings of social stratification. Some had access to better food, care, or protection than others. For the first time in history, privilege began to shape lifespan. Over the centuries, as farming villages grew into cities, life expectancy slowly began to rise again. Not because people suddenly became healthier, but because societies built systems, stored grain for lean years, healers who experimented with medicine, and families who relied on elders to preserve traditions. By the time of ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt, some individuals lived into their 60s or 70s, though many more died young. So the story of civilization and lifespan is not a straight line of progress. It is a jagged path, losses and gains, setbacks and breakthroughs. What changed most was not the biology of humans, but the environments they built around themselves. When we step back and look at the long arc of human history, one thing becomes clear. Longevity is not just about biology. It's about environment, culture, and care. Our ancestors weren't doomed to short lives simply because their bodies failed them. They lived longer or shorter depending on how their societies were organized. Hunter-gatherers thrived because their diets were diverse, their groups small, and their knowledge communal. Farmers initially suffered because of disease and poor diets, but their ability to store food and build communities eventually supported longer lives for some. Each stage of human history shows us that longevity is less a fixed destiny and more a reflection of how we treat each other. And today, we face a similar turning point. Modern medicine and technology have pushed human lifespans further than our ancestors could ever imagine. Yet like the first farmers, we've also introduced new challenges, chronic diseases from sedentary lifestyles, environmental risks, and the question of whether our social systems can keep supporting an aging population. The lesson from prehistory is striking. Compassion and knowledge sharing are what carried humanity forward. Elders weren't just old. They were living archives, survival guides, and the glue holding communities together. If we forget that, we risk losing the very thing that made us human in the first place. So the story of human longevity isn't just about numbers. It's about choices. The choice to care for the vulnerable. The choice to value memory as much as muscle. And the choice to see the elderly not as burdens, but as the reason we survived at all. In the end, the past whispers a warning. Our future longevity depends not just on science, but on how willing we are to remain human.